and there's always this awkward bit at the beginning isn't there <laughs> when you're kind of waiting for people to come in and stuff. I just got my to double check my email actually just to say that. Okay, I'll leave it till five past and then, oh, that is five past. There we go, there's somebody else. <clears throat> okay, I think I'll make a start. Otherwise we'll end up running over far too much as well. Um, so, sorry, I'm just moving my camera so that I can see. Um, so um, thank you um, everybody for joining us and good afternoon and welcome to the last of our reading group sessions um, before Christmas. Um, to give everybody I guess a little bit of background for those of you who haven't joined us before, we've, this is the third session that we've done and the first session um, we read um, a book of uh, Japanese ghost stories translated by Polly Barton. So we went off to, to Asia um, and then the last session we did a book or oh, we did a couple of books translated by Mara Fay Leatham from Catalan. We did um, Brother and Ice and Learning to Talk to Plants. Um, so we, we stayed in Europe and it's great that today we're off to um, South America to talk about this book, which I know is mirrored on the screen, but um, The Adventures of Tina Iron um, by Gabriela Cabezón Camena um, and translated by uh, Dr. Fiona McIntosh and uh, back in diet who are brilliantly joining us today um, to talk about the translation um, and their approaches and the many challenges that were included in the text I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> the book was published by Charco Press which is a small independent publisher which focuses on um, Latin American literature on, and promoting Latin, America, Latin American literature in English-speaking countries um, and was shortlisted for the International Booker Prize um, this year in 2020. Um, before we start, just a couple of housekeeping things um, for everybody. Um, this uh, the session is being both recorded and live streamed on Facebook. Um, so if anybody wants to go back to it at any point, for, if they've missed anything, then they're more than welcome to. I can send links afterwards. Um, and if you to keep your cameras off for an anonymity, that's fine. Like if you like to keep it on and it's more kind of interactive, that's fine as well. And if you've got any questions as we're going along, then um, it's kind of supposed to be a conversation, a discussion. So please feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll keep my eye on it as we're talking um, and I'll try and get them in. But if not, there'll be time for questions and answers um, at the end of the session as well. Um, so without further ado, um, let's um, introduce our two speakers today. Um, who so brilliantly agreed to come along. We have, starting with Dr. Fiona McIntosh, is a senior lecturer in Latin American literature at the University of Edinburgh. Her research interest is in Argentinian fiction and poetry and has published extensively on Alejandra Pizarnik and Silvina Ocampo in particular, as well as on contemporary 
biographers. She has translated Luisa Valenzuelos, uh, the other book for Bomb Magazine and selected poem by Esteban Pajkovic for it. Which I assume that's why you were interviewing her the other day. <laughs> Uh, secondly, we have Dr. Iona McIntyre. She's a senior lecturer in Hispanic studies at the University of Edinburgh. Iona's teaching and research has focused on 19th century Spanish and American history and culture. Um, within this area, she works primarily on Argentina, the history of the book, translation studies, uh, gender studies and trans transatlantic relations. She's also published on the contemporary fiction of Jorge Akami. So thank you both so much um, for coming along today and, and joining us to talk about your translation. Um, I guess one of the brilliant, so talking about the other sessions that we've that we've done uh, and the, the difference today between the other sessions is it's also really good to get an idea of kind of the of, of how collaborative translation works as well and kind of getting an insight into a process that's usually considered so solitary um, and isolating to, to talk about how that that becomes a, a, a more uh, interactive experience. Um, so I, I was saying to you before we started that when I read the book, um, I um, was kind of struck by the, uh, first of all, I enjoyed it immensely, but I was also struck very much by um, kind of reading it with a, a translator's head on and reading it with a, translator, a translation scholar's head on, that it must have been a, a kind of a mountain to climb in terms of, of translation. Um, and kind of when I got, and, but it was, I found it a real roller coaster of a novel as well, that there were so many highs and lows kind of emotionally. And I, it, it, and, and I got, when I got to the end and I read the translator's notes at the end and you described it as a kaleidoscopic novel, I kind of went, yes, that's exactly what it, it was kind of like, it really hit the nail on, on kind of the experience of kind of the different lenses, but also this idea of movement and stuff I thought was brilliant. Um, so it would be, uh, you, no, you, the translator's note was great because it dealt with some many of the translation challenges briefly that you, you would obviously come across and hope we, I'd like to get onto those later but maybe we could start with a kind of more general question that you could if you could tell us how um, you came across the novel uh, kind of in the first place and how it came to be as a translation how you came to work with Charcoal Press and and how the, the translation came into existence. Which of us would you like to go first? You should probably yeah, say I who really you want don't to. mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make a start and Iona, and Iona can, can chip in as well. Um, yeah, I mean, before starting, I'd say thanks very much for the invitation. It's nice to come and talk about this to you. Um, and I'm glad that you loved reading the book so much. It's really nice to get an enthusiastic response to it. Um, yeah, the, the originally, uh, we, we have a book club reading like contemporary Latin American fiction, which came into being just the three of us, Iona, myself and Carolina Orloff, the, um, the, the editor in chief of Charco Press. Um, we go back a long way. We go back about 10, 15 years. And um, so we had this book club because originally we were saying a lot of the stuff we teach on our university courses is all sort of about from up to 20 years ago and it's not the most contemporary writing and we felt like that was a gap in our reading what's actually being written in Latin America at the moment and particularly in Argentina since we both work on Argentina so we had this book club where we were sort of focusing on things published exclusively since 2000 um, and this this was one of the books we read when it when it came out and we were totally excited by this and said oh wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> to translate this and uh, Iona and I have been working together as translators in the sense that we've been teaching a course on literary well translation in general but particularly focusing on literary translation um, over many years together so it's a kind of we, we know how each other work with translation you know yeah. we've been discussing the passages that we'll do with students and the difficulties and the possible solutions and so on so we already had a kind of working relationship as translators um and so you know that and the fact that this book is so steeped in argentinian culture and really requires a knowledge of that culture and its literature and so on to actually get under the skin of the book all those things seem to kind of crystallize uh, plus it was 2019 and it was 100 years of Spanish at Edinburgh being taught and we wanted to do a project that would somehow really mark that centenary as well so all of these things seem to come together in this being a really exciting project I don't know if you want to add something to that Iona <laughs> Um, well just also so thank you Jenny for the lovely invitation having us tonight and 
I think I'm suddenly very acutely aware that Jenny, you're you're the kind of most scary kind of reader for Fiona and I. I think I can speak for both of us that when we think of the person that we're most intimidated about looking at our work, it's the person from the discipline. And by that, I would mean Hispanic studies and translation studies. Um, so yeah, that's terrifying. <laughs> and we haven't we haven't really had a sort of in-depth conversation with someone like you before. So now we're all kind of shy. Um, so to, to sort of continue what Fiona was talking about, um, yeah, there's a story of kind of research and teaching relationships between Fiona and myself and also Carolina Orloff, who's the director at Charco Press. And we've actually worked together loads of times on, 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 on different things. And I would say the biggest one was the sort of contemporary Argentinian fiction um, book club project, spin-off, etc. cetera. Um, but there was, also, there was other things that we did that we collaborated on. Like there was a project looking at kind of links and connections between Uruguay and Scotland, for example. So there's, there's, a, kind of, there's a kind of history there of collaboration. And maybe what's, what's, what's really interesting there is that as much as we've done things together, we haven't written anything together. Fiona and myself had never before, for example, written a research article together. Um, we kind of have now since the publication of The Adventures of Gene Iron. But in terms of writing, that, that was a kind of collaboration that we hadn't experimented with at all, unless you would include things like grant applications or letters of recommendation for students, but something that had a kind of creative or research aspect we, we had never done. It had been much more about um, talking things out and planning and, and kind of concocting schemes. So this, this was a new permutation in the relationship between the three of us. It, it's really interesting to hear. Um, I, I think that something that that I'm trying to, I guess, um, promote in the, in the kind of the work that I'm doing with readers and things like that is kind of bridging all those gaps between kind of like the translation industry between academia, between readers and kind of hoping to kind of tie all of those those bonds together a little bit more tightly. So it's actually really interesting to hear of a, a project that's come out um, of academia so closely linked with with a with a press as well. That it's it's great to hear that that we're st you know and and particularly with a contemporary text as well. I think is. Is, is is really great. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the author herself and her book? She's got she has another book that's been translated and published by Chaco Press as well, doesn't she? So could you tell us a little bit about the author and her kind of body of work and how um, the adventures of Gina kind of fits into to that? Shall I go first? Fiona? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, well, um, yes, um, Chaco. I actually haven't. I had. I, I've got kind of handful of books here, but I haven't actually got Slum Virgin, which is the translation of um, the, the, the other Gabriela Cabezon Camera book that's published by Charco. Um, and that is by Frances Riddle. She's the trans translator. Um, and, that, and that precedes our translation. And that, that is a, re a really, a really amazing, creative, special, special work um, that I would really recommend. Um, I've got I've got another book here. Um, I just want to show you because it's interesting because it's um, it's a graphic novel um, by Cabezon Camada called Beja, um, and that's um, that's a retelling of um, Sleeping Beauty. That's actually about sex trafficking. Sex trafficking, excuse me. Um, and she she worked on that as a narrative and then it was recreated as a graphic novel with an Argentinian writer and what I'm sort of trying to angle here is that she's a very very socially and politically engaged writer from Argentina and she's got a body of work that really reflect that and she's also a very sort of prominent cultural voice in our in Argentina um, and and and, and a, a brave person, and a, a hugely creative, imaginative person as well. So yes, yeah, been a really great privilege to be able to engage with with her written her written work. Yeah, I would add to that. I mean, some of the issues on which she's been very very vocal. She's very um, she's a, a great. Um, speaks out on LGBTQ issues, on environmental issues, um, 
on indigenous rights in Argentina. She's also been quoted a lot um, in support of the recent vote about the legalization of abortion in Argentina. So, you know, these, she speaks out as a kind of public intellectual figure on a range of uh, important social and political issues and cultural issues. So she's definitely um, a voice um, in, in contemporary Argentinian culture. As well as as well as the powerful um, novels, you know, her her voice as a public intellectual is is very prominent too. And how is she received? What what kind of reception has she had? Well, in fact, I, I would say very good. I mean, the media coverage of 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 the original text of um, Las Aventuras de la China Iron was, I mean, it caused quite a stir because it engages with a, a, a national epic and it, and it does quite ch challenging things with that national epic. But I think in general, she's been very warmly received. Um, it, it'll always get some people's backs up the idea of, of, of rewriting Martin Fierro in quite the way that she does it. But um, I think generally speaking, the reception has been very positive. It sounds like it, um, so right from the beginning that you, you started speaking and, and telling us about how we, you, you got to the, the, the translation, um, it sounds like it was a very much a collaborative, collaborative effort with the, starting with the very publisher. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the working as a, as a team, um, how much the, did the author have, um, did she have input as well, um, how it was working as as a kind of as a team on the, the translation of the text between the two of you um could you talk about a little bit about the, the the practicalities i guess of the the translation experience um shall i start off with Iona and then you carry on yeah so i mean uh we didn't work much with the author herself we 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 started at the beginning dividing the text up um sort of three chapters each you know like you do the first three i do the next three so on and then we swapped and read each other's chapters uh, and later on in the process we broke it down into alternate chapters so by then you know we were doing different ones from the ones we had done first previously and so on so we kind of thoroughly went over the whole text both of us um, and later on when it got to the point of fine-tuning things we were meeting and reading aloud we both happened to have research leave for the same semester which was brilliant because that meant we could actually meet you know, this, this is very pre-COVID. We sat <laughs> together in the same room, you know, drinking tea and and uh, reading aloud bits and, and and debating on on word choice and sentence structure and semicolons and all that kind of thing. Um, so so we were quite free doing that, and we we sort of compiled as we went along what we called the archive, which was. Um, basically document for each chapter of the novel detailing things that were challenges things that we needed to bear in mind for other bits of the novel because that's part of the collaborative process that if you weren't necessarily leading on into the next chapter you would want to kind of say well okay I've made this decision about this particular word and that's going to affect what happens in the next chapter and so on. so there is a kind of whole um track and trace of our, our procedure all the way through the all the way through the translation and it's actually been really useful going back to that for events like this you know looking at the, the sort of discussions we had and the kind of decisions we took and so on so there's a whole sort of archive of what we did in the process um Iona do you want to say a bit more about that I might I might just add that a, a really sort of important factor is that we we did read the novel in book club format before we started translating. Um, and so we had that kind of free form, um, sometimes quite anti-intellectual conversation that you have that you have in book clubs, right? Um, very spontaneous and, did you like it? Yes, did you like it? Yes, good, okay. Um, so to feel that kind of enthusiasm and passion and, and, not, and not particularly start to label, oh, I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna kick, the, kick everything down. I don't know if you saw the wobble, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, so that, that was that was a really nice way to begin, and and Carolina Orloff was there for that conversation, and then and then at the beginning stages of the work of translation, Carolina was kind of a, a, around in a sort of support supportive capacity, also a native speaker of Argentinian Spanish, kind of kind of there, often sort of just checking in with us, is like how's it going? You were right. Anything you want to talk about? And I felt, and I think Fiona felt that we were just on a roll very, very quickly. 
and we were immersed very, very quickly. And so we, were, we kind of went into this um, kind of special magical world of translation, which is made just Fiona and I really um, became very, we just worked really, really, really very closely and really dissected what we were doing and, and talked a lot about what we were doing, talk things through. Um, and I and I and I guess that's the that's the really special bit of collaboration. It's the bit that happens out loud. Um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> academics. <laughs> we, we took notes. I mean, we took notes. <laughs> but what's what's not down in the notes is is the kind of fluidity of that conversation and kind of where we began and where we ended up and what we were still talking about five months later and what we couldn't kind of let go and what we were worried about and maybe haunted by and what felt easy and natural. Um, so that was just, um, it was great to share that, um, that, that process of thinking and reading and writing. And also I would add, it was great to share the characters with someone else, which is something you do in a book club. You know, you all have your favorite characters or you like to talk about the character of different people and how they develop through the book and which one you absolutely loathe and uh, that kind of thing. So sharing that kind of intimacy with the characters with another person who has read it equally obsessively and line by line, thinking about how they're gonna translate it, that is also really special. You know, I mean, the best book club sessions are the ones where you really get under the skin of the characters and things. And we, this was a very privileged opportunity to do that in a really fundamental way, you know. It's, it's that feeling um, when, when you read a novel that you really, really like, and you're desperate for your friend or your sister or someone to read it as well. So, so you can sit around chatting about it. And that's, that's what we got to do, you know, professionally. <laughs> That's, that's so because it's that that knee jerk reaction to a book, isn't it? That that, that a book club gives you. It's not you know you're not reading it to analyze it. You're just you're reading it to comment on and kind of give your, you know yeah. that that kind of you know that reaction from the heart. That's that's so interesting. Um, had you worked collaboratively beforehand um, with anybody on any any of the translation projects? Um, and is there and is there something that um, from the collaborative work that you've done that you would take away and use when you translate again, not collaboratively? I, I've when when I was translating the poems of Esteban Pejkovic, I was working with him on that. But it's very different working with the author to actually working with another translator. So I've not, no, I haven't done collaborative translation where you and another person sit down on the translation. But I think the thing I would take away from it is is um, sort of uh, it's quite humbling to realise that what you think is standard English because that's what you speak all the time is not <laughs> and I know that's obvious but it's really brought home to you when two of you who apparently are working in a very similar field and living in a similar place and so on have such different Englishes um, and you come to this text and, 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 and kind of have to pool your linguistic resources and it's actually really fascinating to, to kind of see where you diverge in terms of what you think is standard English or what might be regional or you know we had a few laughs about that. I, I haven't I haven't either. Um, I, this I wanted to show you this is um, a, a COVID um, novel um, which was written originally in Portuguese by 46 um, Portuguese writers um, who each had 24 hours to generate a chapter. So that was a collaborative project in Portugal and I was part of the collaborative um, <laughs> translation project um, in, oh, in, the, in the UK. But it was only collaborative in the sense that I'm one of the 46 translators. I was still on my own, ultimately. And I really... <laughs> And I did just really lament, you know, my my mate who I get to like <laughs> chat about everything in as much detail um, as I want. It, and I, it, yeah, it was it was a, just a really enriching thing to have two two heads and um, someone to talk to, and got quite a lot of kind of feedback, really kind of create creative and linguistic feedback from someone. Um, done in the nicest possible way <laughs> and that that's quite that's probably quite a rare experience um, as well. Thank you. I'm um, talking about linguistic experiences um, I was kind of doing some obviously research and I was kind of watching the um, some of the videos that were done for the for the booker promotion um, 
and um, I, I was listening to um, a video with Jennifer Croft who said that she'd um, read the text both in Spanish and in English and that they were very, very different. Um, could you talk to us a little bit how they're different and um, without going into, I'm, I'm kind of conscious of trying to not pull in too many details too quickly, um, but um, but maybe we could talk about how, how they're different and kind of how you, what, what kind of approach you went with um, to the text and what kind of translation you wanted to um, to produce, if you knew that before you started, I guess. Iona, oh. do you want to start? <laughs> well, I'm terrified. I'm really intimidated by this question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'll try, I'll, I'll try, try and I'll try and kind of um, well I'll just try and be factual. Um, we didn't have um, a, we didn't have a vision and an angle and a lens before we started. So everything that we did was derived through practice and trial and error. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I really struggle to make sure that all notifications on my laptop are off. I apologize. Um, so when, when we began, um, we, we responded to, um, the landscape and the style and the description and our initial decisions were to do with description and very quickly that became an issue, actually a voice and the very distinctive voice of the narrator, China, and how to, how to express that character her worldview, her education, her surroundings, her place in the, you know, the original story of Martin Fierro, how to do all that. And we had to do more in terms of contextualization than the original had to, because the original is for the Argentinian readership, the Latin American readership, the readership in Spanish. And the Martin Fierro text is globally known within, within Spanish speaking culture. Um, so there's a kind of shorthand there that there isn't um, in Englishes. So we had we had to do some kind of work to make that um, sort of sense making work really. Um, what else, Fiona? What else would be important to bring out? Well, I suppose also the um, the gradually developing of the foreignization, because to begin with, I think we were always quite keen to keep in words like pampa and gaucho, but eventually by the time we'd got to part three and then came back again to it's in three parts and by the time we came back to start going over part one again I think by then we had more or less settled on being quite foreignizing in in terms of trying to reflect um that sense of encountering something new and different um that the reader of the original text would get so I think in, in that one respect, probably it's not so different from the original mm. text in that there is this kind of increasing encounter with the unfamiliar as you go through into part three. Um, so that was, was something that was a strategy that, that we didn't start out with, but it definitely evolved as a, a recognizable strategy as we went on. Um, I think it would be fair to say we didn't really devise any plans or intentions before we had worked on the text. It was, it was sort of text first discussion and then many modifications and incarnations of the text. And, that, and that's how our, what could now be called a strategy <laughs> evolved, but you know, retrospectively only. I, I think that's quite normal in translation studies anyway. That strategies tend to come retrospectively rather than apply it, yeah. Um, so uh, you've I, I think, there's loads of things there that I'd, I want to pick up on a, a little bit, particularly about that. I think that the the foreignization work as you've got the developing foreignization works because you're seeing it through her journey as well, aren't you? And you kind of you kind of experiencing it with her. So I think it works almost seamlessly in the in the English in that way. Um, so you've mentioned um, the, the the importance of the source culture, um, and obviously that you know we kind of as as an English. Um, speaking reader who doesn't know any um, for, for an English speaking reader who doesn't know any um, Argentine literature or Argentine culture um, they're kind of met with the blurb on the back of the book that says it's a rewriting of, of the, the, the Mar Martin Fierro epic um, how important is that and, and, and can you talk a little bit about the, the kind of the origins of, of the story and how they've been subverted um, shall I start Iona 
I mean, the, the original is this epic poem written by Jose Hernandez that was published in two parts, in 1872 and then in 1879, the, the, the return part. Um, and it's it's a sort of founding text um, in, in terms of the Argentine nation. Um, and, and this figure, Martin Fierro, is a gaucho who, who is sort of a kind of outlaw figure. Um, and he's seen as a kind of national hero and very masculine. And, and so the certain qualities of, of, of toughness and of um, being able to survive in difficult conditions and so on and so so this sort of mythological well, no, mythologized national figure um becomes very important in the, in the sort of psych collective psyche if you like so um but it, the original poem is um a very male masculine poem i mean female characters are a few and far between in it and china who is martin fierro's abandoned 14 year old wife who's given him two children but then he he is conscripted and disappears and she is is just mentioned really in a couple of verses in the in the original poem no more than that um so uh what gabriela caveson camaro is doing with this is is rescuing a kind of hidden marginalized voice in the original text moving her to center stage um and also queering the main character martin fierro into the bargain so she's kind of doing two things she's making it a woman's narrative rather than a man's narrative and she's she's also queering the main hero cultural figure who's the one who dominates um everyone's view of the original text so that's that's why it's such a sort of um uh, dramatic retelling, if you like. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Forget yeah, where I started from with this. Uh, no, absolutely. I know. Do you have anything to add? Or um, I might, I might just say we did have to, we did have to calibrate quite carefully how much um, we were going to help the reader, and that's not, that is not the right word choice now. But just let's use that for now. The sense of kind of assisting the reader and accessing the Martin Fierro. Um, canonical work because I think I mean I guess Jenny this is kind of your area but you want you want people to read for pleasure and you want people to pick up the book and think it sounds good because it's brilliant um, but there can be it's a sort of almost a, it could be a bit of a turn off this sense of this overarching cultural entity that you don't know anything about um, and we, we like to hope that we um, help to mediate the kind of appeal of that. I, I had a very strong sense um, that, that reader, many readers might um, find the, the setting of the Pampas attractive. I had the impression um, from, pe from people around me that the kind of gaucho figure was exciting and the geography and um, the visual landscape of the Pampa was evocative, poetic, and a, and a sort of nice location. But any sense of homework, um, I think, in a novel can be can be problematic. So we, we really wanted to make um, make that fun and OK. And that, inf that informed a lot of our um, decisions and, and approach. Um I, you talked a, a little bit about the the landscape is hugely important, isn't it? And because the, the different landscape, because it's a, a journey, I guess, in so many ways, isn't it? It's a, it's a kind of coming of age journey as well, but it's a it's a physical journey, um, a, 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 a spiritual journey, I guess, as well. Um, but the landscape is hugely important, um, and I, and I and you and I think you're probably right that it, that it is attractive to a reader, but also the importance of the description for an English reader has got. Is, you've got to conjure up those images in your mind that you might not be familiar with and, and, and make them so specific. Could you talk a little bit about translating the, the, the kind of the description? Um, the, we, we started at the beginning. <laughs> so we started translating chapter one and, and we went from there. Um, and, and the beginning is just lovely and the descriptions are just lovely. So there was this sort of big burst of inspiration, I think for Fiona and I at the beginning of the project to, to sort of look at that lyricism um, and, and just do our very best with it. And part of the multilingual uh, kind of approach that we took 
um, was facilitated by the fact that some of those geographic features or what the names of animals or trees or things are loan words in, in English. So there was some way that we could kind of start to have um, Argentinian Spanish or indigenous derived words in, in our English. And we kind of took it from there. And um, Mar Martin Fierro is a, is, a, is a narrative about a man and, and the things that he does <laughs> on his escapades and the mishaps and problems and scrapes he gets himself into. But the tradition, the whole tradition, like our chess tradition, is, is one that has, shows absolute reverence for the natural world. Um, so th there, there was a sort of memory of other texts that we could also draw on and, uh, and other texts that had been either translated into English, maybe in the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century or travel literature by English speakers who'd been to South America. There, there was ways to kind of tap into kind of creative juices and we we did really we tried hard and we 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 felt that was a very serious responsibility actually yeah I would add to that I mean some of the things that Iona's talking about other other narratives about the landscape there were things like I mean I was reading some Hudson um you know uh, the purple land and and far away and long ago and that kind of thing where there is a lot of love of the land and description of the land and, and i know that um gabriella herself when she was um she told us how she'd been teaching this semester of courses on gauchess li literature had had been reading those kind of texts and teaching them there's also a lot of travel writing on um argentina from you know british travelers who went in the 19th century some of them prospecting to then you know export beef and so on but they wrote a lot about the land and in a former life i was right doing quite a bit of research on travel writing so i had that kind of vocabulary and ways of describing in the back of my mind as well and um in, in part three, where, where you get a lot more indigenous vocabulary, there's a point made in the text about uh, Spanish not having all the words for green, for instance, that exist in Guarani. And there's, a, there's actual description within the text of the kinds of green in different bits of nature, you know, the underside of leaves and the back of ferns and, you know, different bits in swamps and so on and, and and all these different shades of green that need different words you know I mean it's like the kind of cliche about Eskimos and snow but um you know there, there is a, a conscious discussion of words for colors and the, the way different languages deal with dividing up the natural world and its colors and so on so um it was natural to want to explore all those things and to to find solutions which inevitably meant we we ended up bringing in the um, Guarani words and and then glossing, having used the original words. Yeah, I should have I should have made clear as well that part three is in a, is in a different geographic setting, mm. um, in, in a river delta, and it's all river dwelling um, that's described, and it's it's uh, it's literal and metaphoric because China's gone to a much more kind of fluid fluid way of life. Um, but that particular kind of location, that, that watery, river, rivery place, like the Corrientes kind of place in Argentina, is less um, kind of known, I would say, in terms of English language writing. So we had to, um, we, we kind of had to be a bit more DIY when we got to the, the, the liquid land in part three. There's almost something mystical and magical about that third part anyway. So the, 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 it kind of conjures up, I, I don't know, almost something that's not real in my head anyway, that it, even though that, you know that it's based in something real, but actually in my head, it, it was this kind of utopian yeah. kind of, and, and, you know, so I, I, there's probably more artistic license, I guess, that possibly you could have had with that anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, she's she is going into utopian and as a bit of a kind of gesture towards magical realism at certain parts yeah. as well. You know, there's a, you sense this huge kind of literary history behind it all. She wears that very lightly, but I'm sure it's there. You know, and the, the mushrooms and the kind of you know what she sees yeah. after the mushrooms yeah. and everything yeah. is kind of yeah. I, I loved that. Um, I there's there's kind of two things that I want to pick up there. The first one is um, is the the multiculturalism that's kind of in the novel any like so talking about it kind of mediating um 
um, explicitating or mediating or however we want to call it through it, through the translation to make it more clear. But I think that worked so well because you'd got Liz there as well. So you kind of got that feeling that there was two cultures kind of living side by side and there. And she, so she was learning not just about the, you know, the landscape of her own country, but she was also learning about Liz's background and, and Liz's homes. Um, so I, so I, I think that worked. I, so I think more, so the, there was various layers of multiculturalism, I guess, in the text as well, isn't there? Maybe that might be a good point for us to to read the bits because you said uh, you wanted us to do a little bit of reading, and I think some of the bits we've chosen for reading have that that multicultural bringing the British culture alongside China's culture. Would that that'd be that'd yeah? Be that'd be great. Do? That would be lovely to hear from. Yeah. Iona, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, um, so I'm going to read, um, it's from, it's from Towards the Beginning, a chapter called The Wagon. And The Wagon is a very, very kind of important um, space <laughs> for what it contains. And it, and it sort of contains um, China's education about uh, British colonialism is in the wagon. It's a kind of package of information for China. And this isn't this isn't the most um, the most clear paragraph that I could have picked to illustrate that, but I'll, I'll 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 read it. So this is also about Liz as a character. She is very intriguing, mysterious uh, travel companion for China. Who knows what storms Elizabeth had weathered? maybe loneliness. She had two missions in life, to rescue her gringo husband and take charge of the estancia that they were to oversee. It suited her to have someone translate for her, someone not afraid to speak up beside her in the wagon. It was something like that anyway, though I think there was more to it. I remember the look on her face that day. I saw the light in her eyes. She opened the door to the world for me. She was holding the reins, and driving without knowing exactly where she was going in that wagon that had in it a bed and sheets and cups and a teapot and cutlery and petticoats and so many things I didn't know about. I stood looking up at her with the same trust with which Astrasia looked at me every so often when we walked along the fields together. There's a very important dog in this novel. <laughs> Field of fields, uh, it was hard to know whether to use the singular or the plural for that endless plain until a bit later when the fences and landowners arrived, that settled it, but not back then. In those days, the estancia was just a wide open space. We'd walk through the countryside and sometimes Estrasia and I would look at each other and he trusted me the way animals do. In me, Estrasia saw safety, a home the knowledge that he wouldn't be abandoned to the element, elements. That's how I looked at Liz, like a puppy, with a crazy certainty that if she looked back at me in agreement, I would have nothing to fear, and she did. That red-headed woman, that woman who was so pale, you could see the blood moving in her veins and something made her happy or made her angry. Later, I would see her blood freeze from fear, fizz with desire and burn with rage. I don't know if you noticed, but I nearly pronounced elements as elephants. Nobody, no, nobody, <laughs> nobody noticed, it was like <laughs> a whole new take on the novel. <laughs> um, the bit I was going to read is from later on, it's from part two, which is when uh, Liz and China have gone further on their journey and they've arrived at this fort, which is run by... Um, a guy known as the Colonel, but in fact, he his name is Colonel Hernandez, and therefore it is the original author of the original Martin Fierro epic, who is represented here as a character, as this Colonel character, who is uh, very pro-modernizing in Argentina and bringing progress, which for him is bringing railways, bringing um, uh, uh, mechanization, systems of mechanization, exploiting the gaucho workers and so on. And he is this, this sort of brutish, very male figure. So this is from a chapter called Do Come In, My Dear. And he, he, we, we love imagining the colonel's voice, so I might ham it up a bit. We were led through the fort to the main building. 
It was huge, spotlessly white and glossy like the hide of a strong, healthy animal. It had a veranda around it, floors that were so highly polished I was afraid of slipping over, a garden full of flowers and birdsong and a covered well. In the middle of the garden, there was a chair covered with red fabric. Once I'd touched that fabric, I couldn't leave it alone. Its threads were short, and if I stroked it one way, the color was darker. The other way, and it became lighter, and it was so smooth. Sitting right there waiting for us was the colonel. The moment he saw us, he stood up. He bowed. He kissed Liz's hand and began speaking to her. Within two words, he knew she was British and pronounced himself delighted to be conversing with someone born in a nation so great as Fair Albion's estate, slipping effortlessly into rhyming English. Liz presented him with a copy her father had made of Turner's locomotive painting. The Colonel's joy knew no bounds in either language. It's as if, he said, you knew that my purpose in life is to bring trains, the engines of progress to Argentina. Do come in, my dear. I shall have you shown to your rooms. Make yourselves at home. I'll have a bath filled for you to rinse off the dust of the pampas. There's a room for your brother, too. Do please make your way along. Then he turned to one of his servant girls. Chena, take the visitors to the guest rooms. No sooner had Liz stepped onto the parquet floor, onto the rugs, and seen the pictures on the walls, than she visibly revived like a drooping plant in the rain. She swelled and became radiant. Her eyes, her skin, her teeth, everything about her shone. And I finally saw what she'd so often described to me. In a wooden box with a glass lid, which she told me was called a display case, there was a ring. And set in the middle of that ring was a diamond, the stone for which men kill. It was beautiful, as if all the purest water in the world were contained in a single drop, so light and strong. Thank you. <laughs> so, I, brilliantly done for the colour. It's kind of how I imagined. I've got a picture of him in my head as well, in a particular way. <laughs> I mean, it, I, it should really be a be a pompous Argentinian accent, but I think I wouldn't do that nearly so well. So, <laughs> kind of think you, can, you can imagine the kind of figure that he is, and and the the fun we had getting that sort of pomposity and self-importance into the into the narrative. I, the characters are, are, are so well drawn. There's, there's not a huge cast of characters, but they're, they're incredibly well drawn. You get a, a real sense of who that, who they are. Um, but obviously the most important is, is Chena. It's, it's her voice that we hear everything through. Um, could you talk a little bit about translating her voice, largely because th there's a real sense of her growing and, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because at the beginning of the, the novel, you did, you read it through her voice as she was when she was young, but you also know that it's retrospective. So there's, there's kind of two layers from the, from the very beginning there. And that must have been quite challenging um, from a translation point of view, I guess. Or something that you had to be very aware of, I suppose. Um, I was particularly in, in, in the first parts, I was really, I was hoping that that Gina in English would sound really lovely and poetic and engaging, but in a really simple way, just like this the simplest way, and no, and no kind of nothing florid and ostentatious and and showy. That that was quite important to me as an aesthetic. Um, and then I guess kind of because there is growth, isn't there, right? In in, in China's story, and and she receives this education from Liz, but then she's also able to kind of examine what Liz has told her and taught her, and uh, see 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 kind of flaws and contradictions. And she also observes Colonel Hernandez, and she says that she's learning from Colonel Hernandez. Not everything. <laughs> She doesn't want to keep all that education necessarily with her. So at that point, this sort of um, um, kind of questioning, criticality, confusion, um, kind of the selection process for her sort of trying to take in the confusing kind of discursive world, that became that became quite a kind of separate task, as well as her just describing so evocatively the, the landscape through which she was traveling her taking on um, these different forms of education was, was, was very interesting. And I mean, Ch China is just a, like an absolutely brilliant heroine um, and, a, and a very likable literary character. Um, 
and I guess I guess some, sometimes there's um, there's there's wee bits of pastiche where she does sound like a kind of archetypal nineteenth century orphan, kind of raggedy, scrappy street urchin, and then you know then she she is sort of reawakened in in all sorts of ways and um, becomes this sort of passionate, red blooded. Um, person so there's there's so many angles and dimensions to China yeah I would second that I mean at the beginning she aligns herself with this puppy Estrella and I kind of think of her a bit as like a puppy in that she's sort of leaping about enthusiastically everything Liz shows her she's dying to know and she wants to be British because it's just all so exciting and then she gradually gets a bit more kind of critical distance with the whole British Empire thing and and with the colonel as as Iona's just said and then in the final section she's sort of fully come into her own and that's at the point at which she is then taking up writing to retrospectively write the narrative that you've just been reading but it's also where she really comes into her own sexually and that, that she's she's found herself in this very fluid relationship with Liz with the other in Chin people and so on and and so it's, it's like the the narrating voice um comes of age at the point when she sexually has come of age and and somehow it's all all linked she becomes a whole person in that third part really um and i think we were trying to to kind of capture that in in the, the assurance with which she's narrating by that part i think kind of following on from that and i think i um we'd been looking at um with some of the students in the in the in the previous session the reading group session that we did we were thinking about um sample translations for publishers and we were thinking about how um, a sample translation can craft and be the first chapter of, of a book or you know the first 8,000 words so I kind, of, I kind of started reading first chapters of books or particularly in translations in particular ways to kind of think about you know that what would the reader response be and um, and um, what really struck me um, uh, with the first chapter of, of this novel and was the violence in the first time. I found it really, really, but not, but really matter of factly. And then that seemed to, which is what, what, kind of what I was saying at the beginning, where it's very, there are lots of highs and lows in the novel. And, and I found this, this kind of mixture between this really kind of brute force and violence that there is in certain parts to this very soft and loving and lyrical and it's it's so contradictory and that and I think um particularly the 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 sex in the novel is done in la in very specific language as well it's not so although there's kind of a softness to the kind of sexual experience that's going well maybe not the kernels I mean that yeah that might be slightly different but so but some of the later stuff is I guess that but the language is really I don't know I and I and I, I was thinking about the language choices that you'd made particularly with with those kind of scenes if you could maybe say something about that because I, I found that really interesting um, that was one of the things that we talked about a lot wasn't it Iona at the beginning <laughs> you know we wanted to get the tone right and and uh, somehow British is seems a British English seems a lot more prudish um than Argentinian Spanish in terms of its 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 choice of words for sex scenes. So we we did have to work over those bits quite a lot. Um, and going back to, just briefly to what you said about opening bits, I mean, the very first bit that I translated of this was the poem, actually, because I, you know, there's one of the chapters later on in, in part three is just a whole you know, extract of, well, it's not an extract of Martin Fierro, it's in the meter of Martin Fierro, but it's written by by Cabezon Camera. So that was the bit I jumped to, that would have been my um, pitch for the publisher. It's like, here's the poem from halfway through the book. Um, so it does depend on what you're interested in translating first. But yeah, we did, we did work over the sex scenes very carefully because um, we didn't want it to, to either sound like purple prose or to sound too brutal. But there is this 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 hierarchical relationship between Liz and China. Um, at one point, she describes Liz as suffocating her or breaking her in like a horse, and so there, you can't avoid that kind of um, quite brutal colonial um, relationship, if you like, between the two of them. And so that has to be there as well. So it was a a difficult choice, you know, how to how to translate that. I don't know if you want to say more about it. Uh, I could just 
I could just maybe say a couple of things about the, the violence, which I, I, you know, I, I kind of forget until I'm talking to people again or looking for something that how much violence that there was <laughs> and there is um, in the text. And some of it is so kind of vividly described and horrible. Um, and so yeah, I've got these kind of vague memories of being at Fiona's house and, and, and kind of trying to think about the right vocabulary to use in a torture scene. And then it's it's sort of funny because it hasn't remained at the at the sort of front of my consciousness at all. Um, I I think Argentinian literature from the 19th century, its kind of foundational texts are really violent and really explicit graphic. Um, it's a quirk of the canon, and um, and and so it absolutely kind of has to be there in this retelling. Um, but yeah, it's kind of astound it's astoundingly horrible. Some of it, yeah. But I, I don't think we'll do anything like that again. <laughs> it's quite matter of fact, though. It's and I, and I guess it's that it's it. I mean, particularly the first when she when she's describing her early life, and 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 I and I love the opening chapter because of because of the puppy, and you get the jumping of the puppy, and how you know, and, and how sweet the puppy is, and then you get you kind of learn everything about her and how and you know and, and you're like oh okay but that's not the tone of the way that she's writing the way that she's speaking and I think it's it, it's that I guess that that's just her experience and um, I it, it made I read um I don't know if you've read where the crawdads sing is it um I read that recently and it's about a, 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 a girl who grew up kind of fending for herself on um in the swamps in South America uh, in the in the South of USA um and I, I it made me think of that a little bit as well, actually. Um, not hugely similar, but, it, but I think there were similarities in the characters of the two. Um, I'm just going to ask you one last question because um, I know that we're coming up to the hour. I, and you, you've already mentioned the the poem that um, that you include that that's in the that makes up the chapter. Um, and I think you could talk a little bit about. I mean, it, it kind of it, it is a text with so much in it, and then on top of that, you've got a poem, in the, <laughs> an epic poem to translate in the middle. Um, you've translated poetry before. How much of a challenge was translating um, this? Because you decided not to. There is a translation, that's right, but you decided not to use it. Yeah, well, there's only to clarify. There's only sort of six verses of the original Martin Fierro that are quoted directly when Liz um, is talking to the Colonel, and 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 she you know quotes a bit of this poem at him and 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 he says oh you know well we were just exaggerating kind of thing in that so so she's quoting the original poem but then there's another whole chapter when Martin Fierro the character sings and that is not the original poem that is um Gabriela Cabezon Camera's sort of rewriting but within the same meter um so we could only have used the existing translation for this one short bit but we thought given that there's this other bit that we're going to have to translate from scratch we will actually do both of these bits from from scratch, as it were, um, but the, yeah, the challenge is immense because you you know you've got met you've got meter you've got rhyme, you've got this curious combination of nineteenth century vocabulary and a very twenty first century gender dynamic, and um, she does use quite a lot of twenty twenty first century vocabulary as well. So so pitching it in English to know what kind of vocab to use is quite difficult. Um, but um, I think it's a little bit like doing a little bit like doing crossword puzzles, um, <laughs> looking for the right thing and, and working backwards along the lines. You know, you look for what's what the strong key words in each stanza are going to be, what good strong rhymes you can get with those that don't sound like doggerel or, or just a bit lame and then sort of work backwards along the line from that. So you think at the unit, the level of a stanza as a unit and have to be pretty free within that giving I would say priority to rhymes to, to strong words um, and so on rather than trying to go along the lines from the beginning. I, I would I would only say um, that the that the the poetry written by Gabriella is so momentous in the text it's such a theatrical moment when you you've been, you've been hearing about this absolute good for nothing Ugh. Fierro, and he's reappeared at the end for the finale and he's a balladeer and then he you know he gets up and he and he performs his his uh kind of 
what he's been up to. And it's such a, it's just, it's such a theatrical, brilliant bit of, of the story. And it's not, it's not even like the actual end. It's just like one of the last sort of exciting scenes before the curtain comes down kind of thing. And um, Fiona, Fiona um, showed me her, her draft and I, and I was already just like, oh, this is a nightmare. This is, this is gonna, this is just, you know, when we're not, equipped for this how are we going to do it la, la, la. and the first draft was already just like really ace and I need to have worried <laughs> right though it is very theatrical because it actually dramatizes the audience as well the in chin people are all sitting around listening and then of course Gabby describes the reader reaction to his or, sorry the listener the audience reaction to his performance of this um, it's basically he's asking for Chena's pardon for all the bad things he's done to her in the past and he does this through song with his guitar and then they're all oh you know isn't that lovely and they're all crying and they think it's wonderful because they like a good love story you know so she even dramatizes the audience reaction to his performance which actually is very much in the 19th century spirit of the payada where the gauchos have these kind of improvised competitions seeing who's the best one at improvising lyrics to the guitar you know so it, it even that aspect of it is is drawing on a kind of very 19th century tradition, you know, musical tradition. So it's, it's great. It's a, it's a wonderful moment. And I guess in some respects, as a first translator, it's kind of a gift because you can be so creative with it. And you yeah. can, you get, you've got so much to play with, I guess, that you're not, you're not restricted. Um, yeah, it makes me think of Don Quixote actually with him kind of going <laughs> along his travels and then having people perform, kind of, you know, singing your stories. I just don't really think of that. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to open it and see if anybody has any questions. There's not been any in the chat, but if anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask um, Fiona or Iona, then you're you're more than welcome to now. Um, I, I literally could probably sit here and, and talk. <laughs> I loved that. I, I did really love it. And it's the, actually, I've got so much more out of the text, actually, a, a, again, by speaking to you and kind of thinking, about, I, I want to go back and read it again now and in light of um, everything that we talked about. Um, just no, it looks like there there aren't any questions. Um, yeah, I th I think we'll leave it there then. Thank you so much for your time and um, for sharing all your experiences of of the translation, of translating, of the text, um, and of, of Argentine culture as well. Um, it's been really brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, virtual applause um <laughs> oh, thanks and thanks elizabeth and thanks jenny for having us it's been it's been really nice really nice and oh yeah we'd we'd love to wish you all a, a great holiday which is just around the corner yeah, yeah um thanks very merry much merry christmas to you and a merry christmas to everybody thank you for for joining us this evening um so yeah thank you very much thanks and merry christmas have a lovely break bye bye